Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week, we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda, and I am a solo this week. And this is episode 222, Women and Other Monsters with Jess Zimmerman. I was so excited to see this newest title from Jess. She was on the show, I think in its first year, many, many moons ago, talking about Cersei. And it was so much fun. She was such a good guest. I love following her on Twitter. And this book was just a fantastic read. I think for all conspirators, you're going to love it. But we go through some of the monsters in her book that we have not covered on their own on the show. So we've mentioned many of them before, but getting to do this deep dive and sort of seeing Jess's interpretation is absolutely fantastic. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. I also enjoy every single time I get an email telling us that there is a new patron on the show. So thank you so, so much to Anastasia, Jessima, Chris, and Justin for joining the Patreon this week and our supporting producer level patrons, Alicia, Allison, Deborah, Hannah, Jane. Jessica Kinzer, Jessica Stewart, Keegan, Nieselkins, Liz, Megan Linger, Megan Moon, Phil Fresh, Polly, Sarah, Skyla, and Sammy Todd, as well as our legend level patrons. Side note, I just achieved 100% completion on Stardew Valley, which seemed impossible because of the legend fish. Stardew players, you know what I mean. So this week, the legend level patrons have even more resonance for me. Thank you. You are not as annoying to catch as the legend level fish. Audra, Drew, Jack Marie, Key, Lada, Mark, Morgan, Necro Royalty, Renegade, Sana, and BM Scotty. I also have two fantastic fantastic books to recommend to y'all today. One fiction and one nonfiction, just so that you have this little duo, this little pairing, so you can start with whichever you're in the mood for. The first is called Honey Girl, a novel by Morgan Rogers. And the kind of like logline of the book is when becoming an adult means learning to love yourself first. And the protagonist, Grace Porter, just completed a PhD in astronomy. And I love it. The book is fantastic. You got to read it. It's a wonderful, heartfelt, lovely book. But also, it absolutely paired well with the second book I read this week, which is called The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space Time, and Dreams Deferred by Dr. Chanda Prescott Weinstein, who is a physicist and talks all about dark matter, the physics of melanin in skin, the standard model of particle physics, and what might actually lie beyond that. So the two of these books together will get you in a fantastic, sciencey, lovely, introspective mood, and I recommend both of them so highly. As always, you can go to spiritspodcast.com slash books to see a list on bookshop.org of both the books we recommended on the show and books by our guests. So if you want to check those out, go for it. Bookshop.org is also a great place to shop online. I use it to buy mystery novels for my grandma pretty much every other week because they support independent bookstores and have kind of a co-op model where they do profit sharing with the stores that are members. So I love it. We love a co-op here. You know that we do. So check out spiritspodcast.com slash books to pick up a copy of Honey Girl and The Disordered Cosmos. I would also like to remind you all about our merch store at multitude.productions slash merch. You can see merch items for all of the members of the Multitude Collective. Horse has some new merch out right now. Join the party. Had Chad Dice very briefly and then they sold out. So in the meantime, you can get a Chad pin, but we are working on uh, getting those dice back in stock. And obviously Spirits has lots to love. Posters, hats, t-shirts, pins. You got uh, digital coloring books. You got wallpapers for your phone so you can rep Spirits. So if you want to check that out. That is at multitude.productions slash merch. Well, without further ado, guys, we hope you love this episode number 222, Women and Other Monsters with Jess Zimmerman. We are welcoming a, uh, a two-time returning guest. We're going to give you a robe, by the way, after the show, Jess, so you can have a, uh, a little memento. Jess Zimmerman is back because she has a fantastic new book out that came out yesterday, and you should all buy it. So Jess, welcome. Thank you so much for having me back on. I cannot believe like how much more, not more appropriate, but how equally appropriate this book is for you guys' podcast. It's almost as if I wrote this just to have an excuse to come back. I'm not saying that's true, but it seems really plausible. We wouldn't be mad about that. <laughs> Genuinely, we wouldn't be mad about that. I think it probably just proves that all of our interests are very, very much in line. Absolutely. And it's it's been a minute since we had you last on to talk about Cersei. So I think it's a perfect kind of transition to talk about your new book, which is Women and Other Monsters. Hell yeah. <laughs> and can you just remind anybody who missed the first episode or who has listened to so much spirit since then who you are and what you make online? Yeah. So uh, my name's Jess Zimmerman. I am the editor-in-chief of Electric Literature, which actually might be the kind of thing that your listeners really dig. It's, you know, a digital magazine. We publish fiction. We also publish uh, essays that are about 
um, literature, but really literature writ large. So books, but also movies, television, games. What we really want to do is make literature relevant, exciting, and inclusive. Um, and so that means that we're sort of looking at literature from, from various different angles and trying to look at ways that it operates in people's real lives and how our lives can illuminate literature and vice versa. I also, obviously, I write uh, <laughs> separately from that in, in my spare time from that. And so this book is about uh, feminism and female mythological monsters um, from Greek antiquity and really sort of re-evaluating those monstrous women to show sort of the ways that they instantiate these kind of patriarchal stories that were told about what it's okay for women to be like and what it's okay for women to want um, and how all of those are really embodied in these, these monsters that we can then reclaim and rewrite our relationship to. I think this is really great, too, because I, as you can imagine, I blasted through the book. It was fantastic. And you talked a lot about several monsters that we've talked about on the show before, but there's several that we haven't talked about that I think people would recognize just from knowing anything about mythology or just like culture in general. But I, I would love for you to start kind of like you start the book one kind of like defining who this book is for, because I thought you had a really interesting take on like what, quote unquote, women is in the sense of like defining what a monster is? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really important aspect of the book, I think, because we went with this title because to me, it sounds good as hell, women and other monsters. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, women is, you know, a useful shorthand, but it encompasses in the context of this book, a much, much larger segment of the population than just people who identify as women and, and certainly a larger segment of the population than people who uh, were assigned female at birth and were raised as women. The way that I use women in the book, identity doesn't even really figure into it because what I'm sort of looking at is the way that people are sort of treated by society. So, so it includes both people who were raised as women and so who were um, feminized in their upbringing and that affected what they were told was possible for them. It also includes people who are reacted to as women. And so that may be men, that may be non-binary people. There are a lot of ways in which people will feminize you in their reactions to you that have nothing to do with who you actually are. And that's also, you know, people putting you in in a pigeonhole or people, you know, taking you seriously or not taking you seriously. And so it really is more a question of kind of the societal niche that is defined for women. Um, and some of us fit very comfortably, I think. I've never met anyone, <laughs> I think, who does fit very comfortably into that niche, but I think <laughs> some people fit more comfortably and then other people don't feel at home in that niche, but are still often forced into it. That's kind of the concept of womanhood that I'm talking about, because these are, these are the stories that we're told about what it means to be a woman and what women are allowed and what makes women natural or unnatural, what makes women acceptable or grotesque. I think anybody who's had the baggage of how society treats women foisted upon them, if anyone on the street has been like, here, hold this for a second, <laughs> uh, you will take something away from the book, which which I really appreciated. That's exactly it. Yeah, the baggage and which which often is literally the baggage. You've got a purse. Can you hold this for me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, it seems like you're here to help me. Can you answer an irrelevant question that I could have Googled? Yeah. Yes, sure. <laughs> and then can I tell you about the ways that you were wrong? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You start the book, too, with a very helpful definition of like what monster is in terms of what we're going to be discussing today and in the book. Would you mind just giving that quick like definition for our listeners before we really dive in? And then we're going to ask for also the word other, which I think is no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> These are both important definitions. I'm breaking down that whole title. Let's go. <laughs> I got a lot to say about and actually. <laughs> Yes. No, but I mean, both of these, these things, the definite, you know, starting with a good definition, I actually used to teach rhetorical writing. And the first thing that we would always make students do is to write a definition paper, um, defining like a word that was very important in the argument that they were making. You do have to do that. Um, and it makes your writing better. So monster, actually, I didn't go deeply into the scholarly pursuit of monster studies. There is a scholarly area. It's pretty much just this one guy, Jeffrey Jerome Cohen, mm -hmm. and he really defined monster studies. Um, and it's very academic, so I don't go into it too deeply. But the ways that that he defines the monster, kind of the layperson's version, is that the monster is defined in kind of the boundaries of what's acceptable, and the monster polices those boundaries. And so 
when we're asked to think of something as monstrous, what that means is that we are thinking of it as something that's outside of what's natural, outside of what's normal, outside of what's acceptable. And kind of the project that I'm after in the book is is kind of demonstering these monsters. They're presented as monsters in myth, and then because you know these specific myths underline so much symbology that we see in like literature and art and in language, you know, when you hear people talked about as a harpy, they become presented as monstrous kind of throughout this like very Western literature based culture. But that doesn't mean that they need to be monstrous in terms of kind of what we think is normal and what we think is acceptable. And so if the monster sort of patrols the boundaries, and we expand those boundaries, then there's a whole lot of stuff that is actually not only normal, but maybe admirable. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm, oh gosh, I'm just very excited to talk about this with you. (laughs) I want to dive in. You talk about a bunch of different monsters that we've talked about on the show, like I said, but I wanted to dive into a couple of the ones that we haven't like really gone into deep detail with and also talk about kind of the way you contextualize them in the book. So I'm going to start with the sirens because I love that you contextualize sirens with Aerosmith's music (laughs) video for crazy. That's Wonderful. I love that. Can we talk about that real quick? Yeah, my my friend Brad used to run a karaoke reading in Queens, which was such, such a genius idea, um, where people would read a little piece of writing and then sing a karaoke song that was related to that. And I, I hope that they can start doing that again someday when you know things like that exist again and and because i've been sort of promising slash threatening to them for a long time (laughs) that i'm gonna (laughs) that i'm gonna read that part of the book and then sing crazy yeah so honestly sirens was a very hard one for me to write because the concept of the sirens as this story comes down to us is really a story about being seductive having this kind of promise of something. And one of the things that I talk about in this chapter is that it varies depending on the telling what exactly the sirens are promising to people. So it's not always obviously sex related, but it's always something enticing, something seductive. And that's not really something that I have a lot of personal experience with, like as the monstrous person, like I don't think anybody has ever been like, you know what, you're too sexy. Like that's not, (laughs) that's not like, that's not my personal experience. But I have been on the other side of that, you know, looking at these images of women that are presented to us as, you know, this is enticing to you, or this is the way that you're supposed to be enticing to others, and that's where your value is. And so I ended up having to write this chapter from a sort of like, I'm confused about this too perspective, and maybe you are also, because we're given all of these sort of images of women as seductresses. And it's hard to know if that's not the role that you play it's hard to know what relation you're supposed to stand into it. So the reason that I started with crazy is that like, I thought, I mean, it's not, (laughs) it's not okay for me to think it anymore, because I'm 40 years old. But Liv Tyler and Alicia Silverstone were, I think, probably 16 in that video. And I was like 14 when it came out. And I thought they were the hottest thing I had ever (laughs) seen. Like I it just burned into my brain every frame of that video. They're sort of Siren quality was operating in two ways for me. I could see them in the video basically getting whatever they wanted because they were so attractive. They weren't necessarily giving anything. There's a scene where they go into a gas station and and the guy behind the counter kind of motions to them to take whatever they want and they start like sticking bread in their purse and like <laughs> getting Weird. candy and sunglasses. Um and then they go into the photo booth and they, classic gas station yeah, photo booth. Right, the class right. station photo booth. And they take some pictures. We don't see those pictures. And later, Liv performs at like an open mic pole dancing night. And she doesn't really take her clothes off. You know, so nothing is nothing is really given. It's all about the promise, right? Like they're not they're not really giving anything to the gas station guy. They're not really giving anything away to the men in the audience. Um, but they get all that bread and candy at the gas station, they get their gas for free, they get $500 from the open mic night. So I'm watching this as a teen, and I'm simultaneously thinking, okay, this is the way that you navigate the world, this is the way that you succeed. And I'm also thinking, this, well, I don't even know if I was thinking like, this is extremely sexy. I was just like, I was fascinated by it. I was, I was like, obsessed with it. It's the power that they're like using rather than like, oh, I find these people particularly sexy, which we can talk about. Steven Tyler, is that it? The Yeah, Steven Tyler is the is 
both the lead singer and Liv's father. So that's interesting. Exactly. Yeah, we can talk <laughs> about that and sexualizing your own daughter another time, I guess. But yeah, no, it's it's more about the power that they are exuding and using for their own benefit with the promise of like sex or desire that they never actually fulfill. And I think that's like the really interesting thing that ties well to the sirens because it is a promise that they don't plan on ever fulfilling. It's just to get what they need slash want. Exactly. And I kind of think, great, like good for them. Get literally get that bread. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know. That gas station bread. <laughs> but of course, in the form of the story of the sirens, they're a menace. Mm -hmm. Um and they're, and they're literally deadly. And so the way that we're kind of encouraged to read that story in the context of women actually, you know, embodying this power and using this power is that promising something where someone is not then able to collect is kind of a fundamentally, I don't know about criminal, but like a fundamentally like monstrous and cruel act. I feel like we should also give a little context in case people haven't read the Odyssey and the oh, yeah. and stuff. <laughs> like, I feel like everyone knows, like, Siren, Siren Call, Siren Song. I just want to, like, give explicit context for what that story is. That's a really great point, because one, one of the things that happens when these stories, like, really make their way into the culture is that you get kind of a version of them that you understand through just, like, language and reference, um, but you don't always get the original story. Mm -hmm. and the Sirens actually show up in a couple of different classical epic poems. They show up in the story of Jason and the Argonauts, mm -hmm. and they also show up in the Odyssey. And in both cases, what it is is that they're depicted as bird women, so they're mostly birds and they have uh, a woman's head. They're not actually described that way, I think, in either of the poems, because they're not really seen, but they are these creatures on these lonely rocks that each of these ships, you know, has to sail past. And they're essentially an obstacle in your journey, because as you pass them, their song is so, so beautiful that anyone who hears it leaps into the water and drowns. Mm -hmm. Each of these sort of classical boats of myth takes a different approach the, on the Argo. They have Orpheus with them, and Orpheus plays a song that is louder and equally beautiful. So they essentially have like a classical battle of the bands. Mm. Um, they still lose one guy. So one guy is able to hear him and, and he jumps off and, and is lost and is presumably drowned. And then Odysseus, for his journey, he has all of his men stop up their ears with wax. And then he wants to hear the song because Odysseus. it's fine for him. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so he has them tie him to the mast. So they can't hear it. He can, but they won't. They won't let him go. And yeah, so in both of these cases, the sirens don't really appear as physical creatures. They are essentially this kind of like wafting seductiveness that you hear sort of over the waters. Like ambient temptation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when I first really understood what the siren story actually was, I remember thinking like, wow, it's really amazing the kind of like entitlement to fulfill the promise of sex mm -hmm. that explains so much gender based violence. And it also is, I think, like the backbone of this story, which is obviously bad to like lure somebody to their death, no matter how you lure them. But the monstrousness really comes from the fact that like this in particular is the promise and that it's not just not fulfilled, but it, it is like used against men. Yeah, absolutely. Because if the story was there are these very beautiful women with very beautiful voices who live on an island, they sing very beautifully. And if you hear them, you will jump into the water, swim to their island, successfully have sex with them and leave. Like that would, <laughs> no one would have had a problem with that. You're like, all right, fine. In terms of outcomes in the Odyssey, <laughs> sounds like a pretty good one. Be like, oh, sounds great. I guess I'll be an adventurer. No, it's the promise and then the promise kind of going wrong. And I think that that's in many ways the way that that people react to sexual seductiveness or even even kind of sexual adjacent seductiveness is the fact that I am attracted to you is somehow now a bargain that I've made with you that you are drafted into and that that is an obligation to you. Yeah. One thing that's really interesting about the siren. So this isn't true in every story, and I can't offhand remember which ones it is, but. In some of the stories, they actually die if you are able to sail past them without jumping into the water. So it is it is a matter of life or death for them to be able to entice people. And that's something that like 
really feels true sometimes to the female experience <laughs> also. Oh, yeah. Depending on your kind of like marketability of very conventionally defined attractiveness without that, just send me off to see. That's all. Yeah, exactly. Or like the classic, I must laugh at this man's joke because I don't know if he'll get angry and kill me if I don't. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I would love to move on to, um, I think, classically, or at least later on, another depicted uh, bird woman group, and that is the Harpies. Yay! Either I don't remember the story, or I guess I just hadn't heard the story that you recount in the book about the Aeneid and Aeneas coming to the land and finding all of the cattle there. Would you mind uh, giving us a recap on that one? Yeah, it's it's an incredible story, honestly, because like obviously Virgil like did not intend for it to be read the way that to me is so obvious to read it. So basically, so Aeneas and his men land on this island. The island's very beautiful. It's very green. And they see these cattle grazing there. And they're like, oh, great cattle. Those must be for us because why not? We don't see anyone else around here. So they slaughter the cattle. They cook them up. They make a big feast. There's a part where they like make couches out of turf. So they're they're essentially just like digging up the landscape so that they can lounge around and eat these cows. And then the harpies show up. And the way that the harpies are described, it's really interesting to look at them kind of across translations of the Aeneid because the translators tend to really extend themselves on how absolutely disgusting these creatures are. (laughs) That's the main difference between them and the sirens. They're both like birds with women's heads, but the harpies are just gross. Mm -hmm. So they show up, they're very gross, and they're trying to like get the cows. And so of course Aeneas and his men chase them down with swords. Once they corner them and the lead harpy is able to speak to them, what she explains is that this is their island and those are their cows. And that actually, they're just trying to take back their cows. They're not actually trying to like, snatch something away. Mm -hmm. Harpies actually comes from the word for snatchers. This does not matter at any, (laughs) just absolutely doesn't matter at any point. The men don't end up killing them because they essentially have invulnerable skin. So the swords don't do anything. So the harpies end up just cursing the men instead. Um, the, The curse is a little toothless but we won't get into that but um (laughs) but this entire kind of face-off is based on these guys being like cows those are mine and then the harpies are like actually they're ours and then that is like a monstrous thing to do you know that's (laughs) that's the thing that makes the monsters is reasserting their right over this property yeah if i can quote you at you for a second uh, (laughs) you have a great line here which is a man who lays claim to unguarded property is a hero a woman who grasps for her share is an abomination i'm like oh (laughs) yes oh so good i mean an abomination is the way that like people describe the harpies like and they're you know they're like dripping with discharge and whatever they're so gross for essentially being like wombs obscene yeah (laughs) the virgin face and then dripping with i'm just like putrid womb i think was one of the translations and i was like oh boy okay you might as well just call them used and literally all they're doing is being like um excuse me sir can you not steal my cows please (laughs) sorry that was mine (laughs) that's like the mythological equivalent to me of someone cutting you a line and me being like sorry um i think there's a line here when what i really mean is hi you took my spot prepare to die yeah yeah exactly exactly and then they look at you like you're the bitch because bitches are people who point things out that are true (laughs) god forbid i stand up for the thing that i deserve and is mine yeah Call me a harpy. Fine. Love it. (laughs) I will take it. We're going to talk a little bit more about some of the other monstrous women in Greek mythology. But first, we're going to grab a quick refill. Let's go. Now, you guys know that Stitch Fix has been a sponsor of the show for, I think, going on five years. And that means a ton because as a podcaster, you want to be able to count on the fact that you have sponsors not just this week, but next week and the week after and for the end of the year. And Stitch Fix has been a wonderful partner and committing to us at the beginning of every year. Like, hey, yes, we will be on the podcast. We'll be there, you know, every month or twice a month for the whole year, which is fantastic. And I can also count on them in that way for incredible clothing. Uh, You may not know that I've been working on a new tattoo. um, for much of the last few months, another arm of floral tattoos. I'm very excited about it. I'll be sharing pictures when it's done. Don't worry. But I want to show off my fantastic body art with sleeveless garments. And I recently got a couple of sleeveless tunics from Stitch Fix that I absolutely love and that will be taking me into spring and summer. So if you would like to get some hand-selected clothing chosen for you in your budget, in your style, in your size by expert stylists, you got to go to Stitch Fix. Go to stitchfix.com spirits for 25% off when you keep everything in your 
your fix. They will choose for you a bunch of items, send them right to your home. You can try them on and then keep what you love and return what you don't. They have free shipping, easy returns and exchanges with even a prepaid return envelope. So that makes returns super easy. Once more, get started today at stitchfix.com slash spirits to get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That is stitchfix.com slash spirits for 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. stitchfix.com slash spirits. We are also sponsored by Function of Beauty. They are the world leader in customizable beauty, offering precise formulations for your hair's specific needs. And if you find that you aren't loving how your hair looks or you wish that it did something that it didn't do, it might be time to kind of rethink the products that you use. I know that I used the soap that I was in my shower growing up for a decade before I was like, oh wait, I can buy a kind of soap that I like and that smells good and that is good for my skin and my hair and not just the one that I am used to buying. So if you want to check that out, you should go to functionofbeauty.com where they have a wonderful quiz that will tell them about your hair type, your hair goals, like lengthening or volumizing or oil control. And then you get to choose your color and fragrance or go fragrance and dye free if you're into that. And then they'll determine the perfect blend of ingredients, bottle your formula and deliver it right to you. So listen, don't buy off the shelf just to be disappointed ever again. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash spirits to take your quiz and save 20% on your first order. That applies to their full range of customized hair, skin, and body products, by the way. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash spirits to let them know we sent you and to get 20% off your order. Functionofbeauty.com slash spirits. And finally, this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, where spirits listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash spirits. You guys know what fans of therapy we are here on the show. And every time somebody tells us that they are looking into mental health support or they go to therapy for the first time or they feel a little bit less alone because of what they're going through due to the fact that we talk about our mental health challenges all the time, that means so much to us. And the fact that anybody could try therapy or seek it out or even just start thinking about it for the first time because of something we said is like such a gift and incredible. And I get therapy through BetterHelp. It's something that I think you should try as well if you are looking for it. No matter where you are in the world, BetterHelp will get you a certified counselor who has some amount of expertise that is applicable to you. No matter where you are in the world, no matter what kind of expertise you are looking for, BetterHelp will match you with a licensed professional therapist. Start communicating with them in under 48 hours and do a range of video calls, phone calls, chat messages. My my therapist sent me a worksheet recently to complete and I got to send it back to her so she could review it before our next session. You know, I love homework. I love a worksheet. And it's very exciting to be able to do that really easily in the BetterHelp app. They genuinely want you to start living a happier life today. And we love the fact that we get to partner with them and promote mental health on the show. So go to betterhelp.com slash spirits. That's better H-E-L-P.com slash spirits to get 10% off your first month of counseling. Join the over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional at betterhelp.com slash spirits. So now that we are back with our drinks in hand, I would love for you to talk about the Sphinx. Sirens, yes. Harpies, yes. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the Furies later. But the Sphinx, I guess I never really considered like monstrous in my head. I know it's like a half woman lion thing. But in my head, I'm like, this is a majestic creature. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. <laughs> I mean, both of those things are true, right? Like it, it is a majestic creature. It also very much follows the monsters of antiquity formula of just being like either half person, half animal, or several animals stuck together, or sometimes multiple instances of the same animal. So I should back up, I think, probably and, and kind of give a precy of that. The story of the Sphinx in brief, there's a lot more about Oedipus that I think probably people know a little bit by association. But the Sphinx part is that she is this half lion, half woman creature that is laying waste to the city of Thebes you know, killing their cattle and not obviously killing people, but like basically destroying their livelihood and not letting anyone into the city to try to rescue it. So the only way to get past her to get into Thebes is to answer her riddle. Um, and that's really what we mostly have associated with the Sphinx is that she is a mysterious creature that has this riddle. The riddle, it turns out, is not that hard, um, although possibly just because we've known it for... <laughs> for thousands of years. Heard it a million times. But the riddle is what walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs at night, or some variation on that. And the answer is man, who is a baby and crawls around, 
then walks, you know, on two legs and then uses a cane when older. I do like the normalization of like mobility devices. So fair enough. Pretty legit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is it is kind of nice to, to recognize the cane as part of the body. I do appreciate that. One of the things that I talk about in the chapter on the Sphinx is like, of course, the answer is man. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, of course, you couldn't just let this powerful female creature be terrorizing the city. So Oedipus answers the riddle just because he's very, very smart, which turns out in some ways to be his downfall. <laughs> so he's able to to get past her and go into the city. You know, he doesn't fight her at any point. He just answers her riddle. She kills herself. She, she dashes herself on the rocks because somebody has has figured out her her secret. I felt like doing that when people have mansplained things to me before, so I get it. <laughs> that sucks so much, though. Like, it really just kind of reduces her to a sort of transactional being. And that's what I think of when I think of the Sphinx, and having not read the original story. It's like, oh, yes, a transaction, you know, gives you the riddle, you give the answer, and then you can, like, proceed in the maze or whatever. I think that the Sphinx should have made any kind of riddle to do with menstruation or pregnancy, and then Oedipus never no would have known. would have known. Right. Yeah. Oedipus <laughs> never would have known, and then uh, she'd still be having her way with Thebes today. It would barely even have to be a riddle. It could just be like a really yeah. straightforward question. Define the cycle. A friend of mine many, many, many years ago went around DC asking a bunch of cis men how different contraceptives worked. And it was really, really something to watch them try to answer. Like, how does the Nuva ring work? What does it actually do? So she could have just done that one. I think there were probably fewer forms of contraception at the time. But yeah, yeah. So it was a lot of like sticking, like waxed up things yeah orifices pessary yeah. or whatever yeah <laughs> the present is definitely better in, in one way and it's menstrual care right yep. <laughs> but one of the things that's interesting about the sphinx i mean i think people know that there's there's a greek sphinx there's an egyptian sphinx and the, and the egyptian sphinx is the one that there's you know a huge statue of outside the great pyramids that one's pretty male I mean, and I say in the book, like, nobody's turned it over to check, <laughs> but it's, it, you know, it has a beard. It's got kind of a male aspect. Greek Sphinx is definitively female. The story of the Greek Sphinx is actually that she came over, that she came from North Africa. And so essentially, like, her background in the story also follows the trajectory of the story. But I think it's interesting that this was, like, not an exclusively female creature comes into kind of the realm of this story that Sophocles is telling about Oedipus and then becomes a female creature. <laughs> there Sorry, is a- <laughs> it was actually a deep sigh there that I had to hold back. <laughs> there is a version of the story that is really hard to track down. It appears in like one playwright's version of Oedipus that we don't have anymore. So we only have like fragments of historians talking about this play much later. So it may it may be totally apocryphal. But it's possible that there has existed a version in which the Sphinx asks another question. And that riddle is actually kind of about birth. Ooh. Metaphorically, it's the mm. it's something like there are two sisters and one gives birth to the other and the other while the other gives birth to the first. And that's day and night. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes ah. sense. Very Greek answer. I put it in the essay because it was so good. And then I did more research and I was like, oh, I don't even know if this is true. But then this is the nice thing about writing essays, as opposed to like scholarship is that I'd be like, okay, but let's say that it is true. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone at some point made it up. Yeah. And therefore, it's a cultural artifact, even if it doesn't, you know, originate at the same time as the first one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and like, you know, I, I sort of acknowledge like, this is hard to track down. But also, it's so metaphorically robust. And here's what it would do as part of a robust metaphor. So. Oh, yeah. I also really liked when you talked about kind of the fear of other and the power of both other and knowledge when you're talking about the Sphinx, because absolutely, like this is a creature that came from another place and is being a threat because it is foreign and also because it is a female with knowledge that most others don't have. Yeah, that's what I think is very interesting about the Sphinx is that she's sort of she's multiply othered. The fact that she's from Africa, like the racial aspect of that is not made a huge deal of in the stories. But the fact that she is from another place, that's a big deal. So so sort of the xenophobic part of it. And she has like this sort of innate foreignness to her. And the way that people we see as feminine and the way that people we see as foreign are kind of diminished are often different versions of the same thing. So so women are often treated like children. Foreigners are often treated like aliens um, or animals sometimes, um, mm. especially like, you know, people who are racialized often treated like animals. But all of these are ways of kind of denying 
true humanity and denying sort of full, you know, intellectual capacity and full brain function to people that are not essentially the ones telling the stories. So the the Sphinx in her capacity as a woman is not supposed to have these secrets um, and not supposed to have these unanswerable riddles. And then also the Sphinx in her capacity as as a foreigner and an avatar of foreignness is not supposed to have these secrets and these unanswerable riddles because it essentially puts her in a place where she is intellectually over the people who are trying to answer the riddle and failing. Um, and I also feel like that's the reason that the story has to have her kind of dash herself on the rocks at the end. Like, how dare you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doesn't it feel bad to have other people with either the answers, the power or the resources that you don't have access to? Mm -hmm. Like, doesn't that feel bad? <laughs> huh, guys? Yeah. We can probably uh, close out our monster section talking about the Furies, which you point out uh, are also known as the kindly ones in the same way that we, we refer to like the Fae as fair folk because we don't want to piss them off. Can you give us a little bit of context for the background of the Furies? As I remember it, they're usually tied to the story of like Agamemnon being murdered by uh, Clytemnestra and then Clytemnestra getting murdered by Orestes. Yeah, the play The Kindly Ones um, is is part of a like a three part play cycle that those are the other parts of it. And The Humanities, which is The Kindly Ones, um, is essentially an early courtroom drama. Sure is. Hell yeah. It's an early courtroom drama kind of about the invention of the courtroom. So the Furies are hunting down Orestes for exactly what you said for, for killing Clytemnestra and her lover. Instead of them being able to sort of take their bloody revenge, Apollo and Athena set up this court where they can put him on trial and then essentially decide that what he did doesn't matter because he only killed the lady. Oh, like, it's oh not... <laughs> It's really not subtle at all. Like, essentially, Athena has a line where she's like, well, I'm more or less always on the side of men. And so to me, oh, and they, they also discuss like whether a mother is even really involved in birth. Or if she's just the, the bearer of a seed. Yeah. Oh, God, it's, it's <laughs> awful and misogynistic and gross. Like, does it count? Your book and just Greek mythology in general, not kind to Athena. She's fucked up a lot. Yeah, she was, she was <laughs> like really one of my favorite. I mean, I went through, I went through various favorites. I, I was like a huge mythology head when I was a little kid. So she wasn't my first favorite, but she was actually one of my favorites. And then I kind of looked back at her. And you're like, mm, girl. <laughs> Yeah. problematic fave at best but the thing is like i i sort of i said in one of these that she was the original not like the other girl's girl and i think that was also that was why i liked her and then also why i had to think twice about her mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so yes yeah, she comes off terribly in in the humanities she ends up like essentially giving the furies a new job and saying okay well you you no longer get to exact revenge but you can exact exactly the kind of revenge that I tell you is okay. Um. <laughs> sure. Why not? It's really a disaster. The thing about the Furies to begin with is that they're not, I mean, they're called Furies, but they're not chaotic beings, right? They are essentially order keepers. They're positioned to, you know, keep the souls of the dead under control. When they are called upon to take vengeance for something, it's generally something that is a crime against the natural order like matricide if matricide matters which uh, oh no apparently not do 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 moms even count as parents <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're they're just a creature that or a being that i associate with like the phrase righteous fury mm -hmm. like they are angry for a reason and because there deserves to be anger over that thing and i'm sorry i have to go back to athena for a second because i'm still mad about it every once in a while people will listen to our Medusa episode and I'll get emails or messages or DMs and people will be like, well, actually, I heard a story about how Athena really did that to protect Medusa turning her into this uh, monstrous creature after she was raped. And I'm like, not really. I mean, like that is a very generous reading of what Athena did here. Is that like, oh, okay, no man could ever touch you again. But like, that's not how you help a victim. That's, yeah, yeah. I, I have a lot of opinions about Athena and her victim blaming, but that's uh, besides the point. I mean, and like, obviously, I'm all about recontextualizing Greek myths to make them tell a different story. So like, is there a way to tell that story? God, I don't know. Because like you say, like, even if it's coming from a place of kind of mis misapplied and misjudged good intention, 
It's terrible. Yeah. It's like a capital T tragedy. It's not like she and Medusa had a conversation like, I want you to make me extremely ugly and I can now petrify men and turn them to stone. Right. It was just, <laughs> Athena was like, okay, I hope this helps. No. Maybe Athena exists to show us how not to help people. I hope so. And instead, you can say, hey, what do you need and how can I give it to you? I mean, I kind of think that she she does frequently, you know, the couple of times that she comes up in this book, she does kind of play that role of like being a woman who is also kind of an avatar of the patriarchy and who is trying to maintain the status quo. The thing that the real insult to injury in the Medusa story, I think, is then then after Medusa is decapitated, Athena uses her puts her head on her breastplate. Like, oh hey, this power is useful. <laughs> like, go, come on. You can't there's no way of making that into a good thing, especially when she basically assisted the murder of Medusa. Yeah. Like, it's not like she was like, no, don't go kill her. Right, right. She was like, here's the stuff. Sorry, yeah, I made here's her. Here's how ugly. you do it. Yeah. <laughs> Classic. <sighs> there's there's no winning there. Sorry. <laughs> but I do think this could be a challenge for Madeline Miller, who wrote Cersei. Like, if she wants to, if she wants to revisit Athena and give Athena like a whole new I trust it. Yeah. I oh, I'd read it. I would read it. <laughs> I'd read it. That's the only person I trust with it, to be yeah, quite honest. Exactly. I'll probably cry through the last third of it like I did for uh, Song of Achilles and I'll oh be my fine. God, yeah. But back to the Furies. Sorry, not to detract from uh, <laughs> how wonderful they are and uh, their true justice. So the Furies, you know, I kind of bring up the phrase social justice warrior in the book because it's the same kind of idea. Like it's, they are warriors for social justice. That is literally what their job is. And there's no real reason for that to be a bad thing unless social justice and your own particular sort of hegemony are at odds. I'm not by a long shot the first person to try to kind of reclaim the Furies like that. That has a, a long history. I think for a lot of people, that's that may even be kind of a first insight into the way that these stories are weaponized against us. Because if you think too much about the idea of these like angry women who are punishing unnatural crimes and then how that makes them into like these disgusting monstrous beings and you're like wait a second <laughs> so they can be kind of like like an index case i think that really ties in well with kind of what my my final question is i suppose which is why is it we're drawn to monstrous women you know, like as a modern society, why are we so fascinated with these stories? Why do we want to recontextualize them? Why do we want to retell them? Why do we want to reclaim them? Yeah, I mean, I think people recognize instinctively, even if we don't sort of know right away the way that these stories are operating on us and the way that they were designed to operate on us, I think people recognize that there is a power in monstrousness. And I think they, they see that immediately. Because if you're looking at the Sphinx, you know, that's a lion. So I think that it does sort of introduce that cognitive dissonance where you're like, okay, I can see that these are powerful creatures. And I can see, in some cases, I can see that they haven't done anything wrong. That's not always the case. But it's certainly the case for some of these monsters is that they're just trying to live their lives. So, so sort of understanding the disconnect or recognizing the disconnect between what you see in these creatures and how you understand them and the stories that are told about them, I think can be really illuminating for people. And and the power is immediately obvious. So like one of the things that, that sort of convinced me that the time was right for this book is that I have been able to like, not to, not to sort of reduce things to capitalism, but I have a lot of like accessories and stuff that are like, Oh, here's a pin with the Sphinx on it. Or, you know, here's a, here's a like harpy necklace. You know, I have, I have a friend who was making music under the name of the harpy. Like, like you see sort of these images and these symbols being used as symbols and images of power. Like people immediately see the power in them. And so then the question is like, what do we do with the story behind it? Yeah. And how do we kind of rewrite that or re-understand that in order to bring it in line with what we can immediately sort of instinctually understand? I think it's also really helpful signaling to each other that if you see somebody else with a Medusa pin, it says like, I too am on the fringes. You know, I too have felt on the outside. I too have been made into the monster and you're going to find a friend in me. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a great way of learning how to retell these stories and reclaim them is by buying Jess's book. <laughs> 
I won't disagree. <laughs> Hooray! It came out yesterday, uh, as of when this episode comes out, or you can request that your local library buy it, which also ultimately goes to the same place. Jess, please tell us all about where folks can get the book and also to follow you and your work online. Yeah, um, I mean, you can get it at pretty much any place that you that you get books. I like bookshop.org because it's a way to support independent bookshops without having to necessarily pick a specific one. But it's also great if you have a favorite independent bookshop, you can order it through them. Um, I've tried it from a couple of places and it always seems to work. So it will probably work from your store too. And there's also there's an audio book uh, at libro.fm, um, which also supports independent bookstores. Awesome. Hooray. And people can find you online where? Yes, you can find me online, probably mostly on Twitter, probably more on Twitter than I should be at jzims. It's J underscore Z-I-M-M-S. I hope I said the correct number of M's there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll link it anyway. They can just click. All right. Thank you. And you can sign up for my newsletter, which is deadchannel.substack.com. It's a great one. Has not mostly been about monsters, but it might be about monsters at some point. <laughs> if we talk long enough, everything becomes about monsters, That's which true. I really appreciate. <laughs> That's true. That's just my life. Jess, thank you so much for coming on the show. I look forward to uh, the next time we can see each other in person and I can compliment your monstrous accessories. Yes. In the meantime, everybody, remember, stay creepy, stay cool. Thanks again to our sponsors. At stitchfix.com slash spirits, you'll get 25% off when you keep your whole box. At betterhelp.com slash spirits, you'll get 10% off your first month of counseling. And at functionofbeauty.com slash spirits, you'll save 20% off your first order. Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us at Spirits Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. We also have all of our episode transcripts, guest appearances, and merch on our website, as well as a form to send us your urban legends at spiritspodcast.com. Join our member community on Patreon, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Just one dollar gets you access to audio extras with so much more available too. Recipe cards, director's commentaries, exclusive merch, and real physical gifts. We are a founding member of Multitude, a collective of independent audio professionals. If you like spirits, you will love the other shows that live on our website at multitude.productions. And above all else, if you liked what you heard today, please share us with your friends. That is the very best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.